In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. These are some fascinating Bible readings, and without a broad context for them, it can take a bit of unpacking. So you all have a semester? <laughs> I'm just that gospel reading alone. You know, we could have a lot of fun with that. Um, but what's interesting, there is one sort of theme which does, or almost a demand, which runs through all four of them. So I want to kind of tie this together a bit. You know, our prayer for the day, um, this in, in the Anglican tradition, this collect of the day, is it, it's a classic. Um, Anglicans worldwide, it's one of our favorites, okay? It gives us a method for encountering the Bible. In fact, for encountering God through His Word in the Bible. Blessed Lord, who caused all Scripture to be written for our learning, grant us, okay, here's, here's, here's the method, grant us so to hear them, Read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them. But why? But why? That we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. We have a progression here from an initial encounter with God through His Word to an ever-deepening study of God through His Word, and then actually living life His way. Living it by faith, living it... It's personal. It's not merely academic, it's personal. It says, you know, to take hold. To take hold of it. Or, you know, if it's the best you can do, to even take hold of the possibility of God. It's a peculiar malady in religion in the West since the Enlightenment. That we want to have everything explained, everything proved, all our ducks in a row, before we even set out on a life of exploration of faith, exploring a life in God. But you know, I mean, even in science, there comes a time when you have to move from theoretical science to experimental science, or as we would say, as we meet here above an award-winning restaurant, the proof is in the pudding. Now that's an expression you've heard before, the proof is in the pudding. Ah, but you know what's implied in that is that the proof is not in the recipe. The recipe is important. <laughs> The recipe is an important place to start. But have you ever gotten one of these fancy, glossy cooking magazines and seen a recipe, maybe even with a beautiful picture, and said, wow, now that looks fantastic. And so you slavishly imitated that recipe, put everything in, every ounce of foie gras it asked for, and no more and no less, and every caper. And then when you ate it, you're saying, man, something's missing here. Right? The proof is in the pudding. Sooner or later, you've got to get your theories out there. I'm going to change metaphors now. Get your good ideas out there and just see if they fly. The proof is in the pudding. It's not in the room. Hey, I had a very interesting... Some of you know this story. Um, this, this happened to me. Very interesting um, example of how this can work. Um, I keep thinking of this story in the Exodus, for example, where... The migrating Hebrews come up to the Jordan River. Oops, you know, it's not Pittsburgh, no bridge. You know, God, through Moses, says, it's all right, have your priests go first, and uh, it'll be okay, just, just, just walk right in, you know. And so as soon as their toes touch the water, it sort of starts damming up, and they were able to walk across on the right ground. And I had an experience like that in my life. I first had a suspicion that I was called to ordained ministry um, way back in my senior, year, uh, my senior year of college, and I had two senior years because of a double major. And uh, it wasn't the way I wanted to go. I, 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 had another, I had another plan for my life, not ordained ministry. But I could never really get rid of that idea. 
20 years later, I finally decided to do something about it. I got a spiritual director. Her name was Jean Steele. At the time, she was the archdeacon of the diocese. And I think it was my second session with uh, Deacon Jean Steele. She said, so you've been wrestling with this sense of a call to ministry for, you said, 20 years? I said, yeah, 20 years, exactly. And she said, seems a little long. I said, yeah. She said, well, I'm going to tell you what to do. You've got a good life. Just say no. Put it behind you. Get on with life. Say no. She's, she was very direct. So I'd come to trust her. Just, just say no. Now? I said, I can't. I can't. She said, well, you have one other option. <laughs> it's kind of like computer science, right? You got zero and you got one, right? You can't go and get halfway between. There's no point five there. And she said, well, say yes and see what happens. So I said yes. It was amazing. Boom, 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 boom. Doors just started opening up. Okay? It was funding, it was seminary, it was a schedule that worked out with my employer so I could do seminary and keep on working and making money at the same time. Within 10 days of saying yes to the Lord's call on my life in terms of ordained ministry, I had my first official call from a parish. It wasn't ordained yet, but I had a ministry of position at the church up in Oakland. And it just kept on going like that for a couple of years. It's absolutely amazing. So that is the kind of thing that we're talking about here. Sometimes you just got to move from the theory, from talking about it and discussing it. In my case, even praying about it, probably not enough. But you finally have to say, I have a hunch, I know what I'm supposed to be doing. Let's just try it and see where God takes me in this thing. And our four stories, well, our three stories and, and our psalm today, they all seem to, in one way or another, call a person into a life of faith and trust and reliance on God as infinitely wise. God is acting pretty good at his job. Um, so in our first lesson, we have the early Israelite judge Deborah telling Barak, all right, God wants you to take 10,000 soldiers and go up on top of this mountain. Okay, this is somebody with not a lot of military experience, but anyway, Deborah says, this is what God wants you to do. Get 10,000 men, arm them, and get up on top of that mountain. Yeah. It's okay. He'll give you victory. Yeah, like, how do you get it out? Okay. But he did, and he did. The psalm tells us to lift up our eyes to the one who is enthroned in the heavens, that we can look to God with the, the same trust and even the same expectation that a, uh, a servant can look to a good master for it. That this is faith well placed. So our eyes look to the Lord our God until he show us his mercy. But his mercy, that's, that's the proof in the pudding. You've got to get away from the recipe and actually make it. you got to step out. you got to look to him. And then he shows up. Our epistle, which is St. Paul's first of two letters to the church in Thessalonica. It's, it's mostly about Christ's coming again. It's what we'll call the second coming of Christ. Or the culminating coming of Christ. And uh, he's, he's saying, look, I know it hasn't happened yet. Sometimes it's hard to believe it's ever going to happen. But he said, it will, it will. You know, in faith and hope in his return. You know, we're to keep alert. Take this seriously. Paul's words are awake, sober. And it's not a scary thing. He says it's a good thing. Listen to it. St. Paul says, for God has destined us not to wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about the rescue. 
not out to get me. That's kind of good news. God isn't this way. Oops. Sad. Huh? He's destined us not for his wrath, but to save us, to rescue us. Then our gospel. Um, this is also about stepping out in faith. It's about doing something about it. It might not be fancy. It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be super original. But we have two good servants. And um, they, you know, they do well with what they're given. We also have a lazy servant. Uh, more than lazy. The text actually says he's wicked. Um, so a bad servant. And this servant does absolutely nothing. He basically sits on it buries this little investment opportunity in the ground. Now, what is the root of the evil of the wicked servant? What is the root of his inertia? It's that he doesn't trust in the master's goodness. He doesn't expect the goodness of his master. He doesn't have faith in the master's goodness. He doesn't believe in the reward. You know, He doesn't believe that the master would take pleasure in him. That is so wrong. This is the master who did the other servants and says, Hey, well done. Good for you. Giving you a promotion. Yeah. This one just doesn't believe in the goodness and the pleasure that the master can take in it. Doesn't believe in the well done. He gets God's character so, so wrong. I know you're a severe man. Reaping where you haven't sown, you know, doing all this stuff that really we're breaking our backs for you and you're getting all the games. Well, it's an accusation of injustice. And this represents God in the story in the parable. God just looks at that. You're just so wrong. You idiot. How can you believe that about me? I'm trying to give you evidence, you know, if you would just at least have taken that little bit I've given you and taken it to the bank instead of burying it in the ground, you know, you could have seen how my goodness works. He's got some theories about God, but he really needs more experience with God. Because actually the truth about God is, what is the truth about God? St. Paul already told us that God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation. It's for our rescue. God is all about our rescue. A rescue from the human condition, which sucks. Yeah. It's, it's, it's about the rescue. It's about the blessing. It's about the well done. Enter into my joy. Share it. So what is the coin, what is the talent in your life right now that God is giving you the means, the opportunity that you have to take your next step in walking with God? You know, if God is God, not, not have some potential within yourself, but, you know, the divine other, the perfect, the powerful, the awesome, good, transforming, creative, divine other. If God is the creative force and the benevolence and person who is Lord of the universe, he is competent to be Lord of your life. That was a long sentence. What I just said was, he can run your life better than you can. But how are you going to know? You just bury that coin in the ground instead of stepping out in faith to test God's promises and see if he shows up. I do have to confess to all of you, right now, I have no idea why, really. I don't know if it's psychological. I don't know if it's the weather. I I am not right now in a phase where I think I'm really trusting. I don't think I am actually practicing what I'm preaching very much. Um, I so don't trust God in so many of the ways that I could trust God. Oh, I trust Him in a lot of ways because I have experience. 
But there are so many more areas of my life that I know I'm supposed to be trusting in. And I just kind of haven't done it. It's so much more natural for me to be kind of anxious about it and think, well, I, I gotta work hard first, but then I'm gonna turn it over to him to finish up. That's exactly backwards. Exactly backwards. If God is God, if we can lean on Him, it might be for the first time. Or it might be for the umpteenth time if we've been on the pilgrimage for a long time. But we can lean on Him you know, in newer and newer ways. We can do it more and more and more. There are more areas of our lives on which we can lean on Him. Put Jesus first, I told you at the beginning of the year. Put Jesus first as our priority as a congregation. Put Jesus first. There are so many ways in which we have done that. I'll tell you, there's so many ways we haven't yet. Yeah, still a month and a half left in the year. And we have a lifetime also, right? Keep on putting Jesus first. So let's hear God as his word is embodied in Jesus Christ. Let's hear God as his word is embodied in the Bible. Let's study it real good. Let's process it, inwardly digest it. And then let's live experimentally. Let's follow him. Let's follow him more. And more. Let's lean on it more and more. Hey, I want to challenge you. That's the bottom line. I want to challenge you to find some department of your life that he will not be Lord of. Is there some department of your life that he will not? If you give him a chance, I want you to find some department of your life that he cannot or will not be Lord of. To fix, to transform, to bless, and to turn into something glorious. Amen. <clears throat>